Hilary Byron, <laughs> who is a um, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture postdoctoral fellow here in the Hobbs School. Um, Dr. Byerly Clint is a behavioral economist interested in how people manage and value um, the natural environment, especially in the context of private lands. Uh, she holds a BA in environmental studies and international affairs from the University of Colorado Boulder, an MS in applied economics from Cornell University, and PhD in natural resources from the University of Vermont. Um, before coming to UW, Dr. Byerly Flint was a postdoc at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, where she studied how uh, homeowners manage wildfire fire risk in the American West. And here at the University of Wyoming, she uh, leads and assists on several projects, including a study focused on improving the design and delivery of conservation incentive programs um, for private landowners in big game migration corridors. And as you'll hear about today, a study investigating how national park visitors uh, value wildlife and what their willingness to pay might be to help conserve um, those species whose ranges fall outside of park boundaries. So without further ado, um, Thank you, Lucas. Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you about this project today. A little disclaimer, it's more on the uh, methods, the background, less on the results. Part, I hope things are helpful for your students and thinking about your own work. Um, we also haven't had a chance to do a lot of the analysis yet. So, um, hit the next slide. I want to acknowledge my project team and funders, um, Drew Bennett, if you don't know him, you should. Aaron uh, Enriquez finished his PhD in the economics department at UW a couple years ago. Um, Arthur Middleton at UC Berkeley. And then we've had some really helpful input from Leslie Richardson at the Park Service. And our uh, research assistant this summer, Avi Bauer, was, was really outstanding. Um, I'm going to start big picture. Um, this here, I hope you can kind of see it, it's a, a map of protected areas around the globe. They're in the, the dark blue. Um, and these protected areas are really essential for protecting biodiversity, maintaining um, natural processes, ecosystem services and functions. But um, they're often surrounded by this land, non-intact land, as the authors call it here in yellow, that has been altered by human activity. And so as a result, um, these protected areas are um, often insufficient um, to, to protect the wildlife um, that um, in their areas. And so um, these, these authors find actually uh, modeling out that, that protected areas are seem insufficient to safeguard half of the world's mammals from extinction. So animals like the Indochinese tiger that has a large range or the wildebeest that seasonally migrate. Um, and, and what these authors conclude is not, what matters is not the total amount of land that is protected. And this is, this is relevant as we're thinking, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this global and national effort to protect 30% of land and waters by 2030. But instead, whether the protection is in the right places, whether protected areas are large enough or well enough connected to other areas to support populations um, over the long term. And so the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is an excellent example of this challenge. Um, it's one of the world's largest, most intact temperate ecosystems at 24 million acres. Um, it's here in this blue, down the kind of blue boundary of it. Um, this is the northwest corner of Wyoming. Idaho and Montana um, it has these core protected areas of so Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. But then <clears throat> the broader ecosystem is really a patchwork landscape. So the, the lighter green is national forest, mixed use. Um, and then the white, which is just actually not labeled on this map, it's sort of a void, is private land. Um, and that makes up 30% of the ecosystem. And this land, well, much of it might be intact now, it's certainly at risk of subdivision or development. Um, this ecosystem is also home to the highest diversity of large wide ranging animals in North America. Um, so I'm gonna use this term wide ranging wildlife throughout this presentation, we're talking about animals that seasonally migrate or range outside of protected area boundaries. Um, and for this project and for the 
um, conservation and policy issues that motivated this work, we're really focusing on two groups. So one um, is migratory ungulates. These are elk, in particular, pronghorn, deer, also bison, moose, and bighorn sheep. Um, and these, these animals seasonally move across the landscape. So this map is, again, kind of that Yellowstone region. We have Yellowstone and Grand Teton and the light brown. And then the lines are um, the movement of elk herd, different elk herds. So they start their, when their summers in these protected areas and then move to lower elevations to spend winters typically on private lands. Um, and then we're also talking about large carnivores, uh, bears, and wolves. So again, the same greater uh, Yellowstone region, the little squares Yellowstone and those squiggly one Grand Teton underneath. And then the, the shaded areas are, are elk herds. Um, the green here is occupied grizzly bear range. And this is just up until um, 2010. So it's likely expanded. We can see how these animals are really moving outside these protected areas. And so as a result, um, we have a lot of challenges living with and supporting wildlife in the greater Yellowstone. So there's, I think they've estimated about 15,000 big game animals are killed every year in Wyoming in vehicle collisions. Um, there's thousands of miles of fencing that can interfere with migrations. Wolves and bears prey on livestock. Um, elk in particular can damage crops. They compete with livestock for forage and can also carry brucellosis, which um, can decimate cattle herds. And all these animals are experiencing habitat degradation and loss. And so we've got these protected areas insufficient to provide habitat for these species. As a result, these animals are where people are. And so we have costs for local communities and agencies, um, conflict and reduced tolerance for wildlife in the area, and then um, population threatened wildlife populations, um, certainly over the long term. And and this is really something that's common across the globe. So you know, think of elephants trampling crops in Kenya or tigers um, predating livestock in India. Um, and then, you know, just as you would see in Masai Mara or Jim Corbett National Park, these same wildlife that create costs attract a lot of attention from park visitors. Um, these are shots that I just took driving around the parks this summer. Um, up here, there's a black bear right there, and probably at least 50 people lined up along this railing um, to look at it. It's an elk that people are photographing, bison, another bear. Um, and so it's really, it's obvious to anyone passing through these parks that um, wildlife are a major attraction for park visitors. And visitors also report their interest in seeing wildlife. So. On the left, um, these are results from a 2008 survey of Yellowstone visitors um, who were asked, what are the top five animals you most wanna see in Yellowstone? And you can see bear, wolf, um, elk, all these wide ranging wildlife are among the top rated. Um, and then about 60% of survey respondents rated bear viewing specifically is very important to their decision to take a trip to Yellowstone. Um, this, here is from a, the 2018 Visitor Use Survey for Yellowstone, and the large majority of respondents, I think it's about 95%, rated seeing wildlife as very important or extremely important to their, um, their reason and their experience for visiting Yellowstone. So it's easy to observe that uh, visitors are trying, want to see wildlife, and then visitors also report that viewing wildlife is important. Um, but we don't actually know the magnitude, how large those benefits are from viewing wildlife. Um, when you think about the economic effects or benefits of wildlife accruing from one, expenditures made by people who travel to the region to, with the purpose of viewing wildlife, um, but also the value or the satisfaction that the people get from the experience. Um, and this is not something for which there's a market price that you can aggregate up. And so we have to use these non-market valuation approaches um, to estimate that. And so in quantifying the benefits of wildlife viewing, it's really, it's important because um, it can inform decisions that have trade-offs, right? All decisions do, but so 
um, as a society, as managers are thinking about, you know, how to manage set management targets, for example, um, whether to manage wildlife for consumptive uses like hunting or non-consumptive uses like viewing. Um, so this is um, this estimate here, a day spent hunting big game in the Intermountain West is valued at on average $88 per person per day spent hunting. This is from a meta-analysis of a bunch of studies on the benefits that people get from hunting. Um, and you aggregate that up to the number of people who are hunting and the amount of days they spend, it's a non-trivial amount. Um, another study estimated the, the economic contributions of big game hunting in Wyoming to be about $300 million a year. Um, and so this is a, it's a big industry, a lot of benefits. Um, but then Bridget Borg and colleagues looked at data on wolf um, hunting as well as sightings outside and within Denali and Yellowstone National Parks and found a direct trade-off. So sightings, wolf sightings in both parks were significantly reduced by hunting and trapping um, wolves around the parks. Um, quantifying these benefits of wildlife viewing also can inform decisions about how to allocate resources and where to make investments um, and potentially policy changes. So elk viewing um, at an Oregon state wildlife area was valued about $6 million to generate about $6 million in benefits annually. This was 30 times the operating budget for this little place. Um, and then our colleague Leslie uh, Richardson used data from that 2008 study to estimate that Yellowstone visitors were willing to pay for an additional $40 in park entrance fees just to keep bears along the roads where they were easy to see. Um, and so this idea that visitors might be willing to pay for wildlife and it's been um, attracted a bit of attention in the region recently. Um, so over on the left, these are resolutions from in front of the Wyoming state legislature and behind it, the Montana state legislature, um, where these the legislature has passed with bi bipartisan support, um, a resolution requesting that Yellowstone and Grand Teton collect a conservation fee from park visitors um, that be distributed back to the states to support conservation um, outside of the parks. And this idea was explored in this paper um, by Arthur and Temple um, that came out last summer. Where they did some back of the envelope con uh, calculations, thinking about how much money um, such a conservation fee could raise, or conversely, it was a, a lodging tax, I think. And then also talking about how this is actually a, a common practice for several other protected areas internationally. Um, so it's not a, a novel idea that this might be a source of funding for conservation. Um, there are also nonprofits like the Greater Yellowstone Coalition that are interested in this idea. Um, so the goal of our work was really to generate some data and evidence that could help inform these conversations in the Greater Yellowstone and globally um, area, in, in areas where these protected areas are not large enough to support wildlife. As a result, wildlife creates costs for surrounding communities, but yet millions of visitors travel to benefit from, um, from that same wildlife. So we set out to, to quantify um, the magnitude and distribution of benefits from wildlife viewing. Um, and so we're also maybe interested in how um, the value of wildlife viewing might change um, based on preferences for different species. Um, and we have data for that. And then we're also maybe interested in how the value might change for those who live within the greater Yellowstone region um, and those who travel from afar. And then we set out to explore um, a potential mechanism for reallocating these benefits that accrue to park visitors back to the surrounding communities who effectively provide the wildlife. So sort of like a payment for ecosystem service idea. Um, and so we wanted to estimate the willingness to pay for conservation outside park boundaries, um, and then preferences for and effects of how um, funds are raised. So we did this in two parts, um, one survey, two parts, um, and uh, the first part was conducted in person. Uh, visitors were asked about characteristics of their visit, so how many trips they take to, to the parks, um, how many people are splitting expenses, we asked about their wildlife viewing preferences. So which species did they want to see? How important was wildlife viewing to their trips? 
um, and then responding characteristics, so demographics. And then uh, we use the tra travel cost method to estimate the value of wildlife viewing and the effect of species preference and GYE residents on that value. Um, and this is a revealed preference method for, of non-market valuation because we're using observations of trips and trip costs to reveal, to show um, how much visitors um, sort of willing to pay to view wildlife. And then the second part of the survey um, was conducted online. And the main event, there were a handful of questions, but the main event was this dichotomous choice contingent valuation question. Um, and and that, is some, that was a question that asks visitors straight up, are you willing to pay X amount to protect this wide ranging wildlife? So it's a, a stated, um, stated preference <laughs> method. Um, and we were also interested within that, um, the effect of, of how that money was raised on that value. So if the if visitors were asked to make a voluntary donation to support wildlife conservation, compared to whether they were asked to pay a mandatory fee. And specifically, if they had to pay that fee, would that affect future trips that they might take to these parks? Um, and then um, lastly, we embedded a, a little framing experiment into the, uh, into the survey that had just the standard questions as a control group, and then um, some additional language about how hunters and anglers in Wyoming pay a conservation stamp towards wildlife conservation um, to see <coughs> the effect that that language might have on people's willingness to pay. Um, and so out of this, we hope to, to get a value for transboundary wildlife conservation from park visitors, effect of the fee on that value on visitation, and also by demographic, right? So this fee could disproportionately affect certain groups who maybe already face barriers getting into the parks. Um, and then the effect of highlighting others' contributions through that um, conservation stamp framing. Well, this is the dichotomous <clears throat> choice contingent valuation setup. So before uh, participants in the study saw the, this language, they were they got kind of the background that I just gave you. So this is what wide-ranging wildlife are, which are their habitat needs. Um, these are the threats that they face outside of park boundaries. And then in response, stakeholders have proposed collecting voluntary donations from visitors to these parks um, to protect wide ranging wildlife outside of Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. Um, participants were told if this proposal is adopted, the suggested donation would be $5. This was varied um, five, 10, 20, up to $500. Um, so Participants are randomly assigned to see some value. They're told this is the effect of their them being willing to pay that it would prevent the loss of wide-ranging wildlife by address, addressing factors that reduce their populations, like habitat loss, vehicle collisions, and human wildlife conflict. And then ultimately, <laughs> would you make a donation of that amount to the conservation fund? Um, that's the dichotomous choice, yes or no. Um, and so, so this was the donation setup. Um, for the, the study. And then we, as I said, we split our sample. So some participants are randomly assigned to see the question framed in the donation way. And then the other half saw it um, set up as a mandatory fee. So in response, state legislators and conservation organizations have proposed that all park visitors pay a mandatory conservation fee. Most of the language was consistent, the amounts were varied, um, and then the dichotomous choice here is if you had a chance to vote on this proposal, because obviously if it's a mandatory fee, you can't choose not to pay it, um, then um, how would you vote? So, um, and then now here, this is the language from the, the flight framing experiment. So the control had just the same sort of set, set up that you saw on the last slide, but then um, some folks saw this additional language here before they were asked um, how they would vote or if they would pay, which is, um, in the same way that hunters and anglers in Wyoming are required to purchase a conservation stamp to fund wildlife conservation, this fee would require the millions of visitors who enjoy viewing wildlife to help pay for its conservation. Um, so, yeah. So, um, so as I said, this was a, a two-stage survey. Um, so first, the in-person survey was conducted um, this past summer. We um, intercepted park visitors and then asked if they were willing to participate in the survey. 
And then um, a research assistant read the, the questions out loud and recorded them on a tablet. And then once uh, participants had finished that survey, we were invited to participate in an online survey. So we collected email addresses, we had little cards with QR code and the link to a website, uh, and recruited folks to, um, to do part two. We also gave them a unique ID code to match responses between the two surveys. Um, as I said, we did this in this past summer, July and August, and a little bit of September. Um, we would sampled at multiple locations inside the parks and then just outside. Um, and then we sought to get a, an even spread of days of the week, times of day, geographies, and then activities or attractions, right? So not exclusively sampling in areas where people are there to see wildlife, but really seeking out like um, visitor centers, general stores, areas where like a broad swath of visitors are gonna pass through. <coughs> I'm not gonna go into this too much, but I'll just say if anyone is interested in doing research in Yellowstone or Grand Teton or any other national park, um, there's a specific process you have to go through. Be happy to chat about it um, in the Q&A or um, after the after the seminar. So a little snapshot of results. Um, so we got 1,015 responses to our in-person survey. Um, 2,500 people were intercepted, so a 40% response rate. Um, and then you can see over on the left that this responses were really pretty evenly split between our areas, whether within the park or outside the parks, um, and then the locations in which we studied, um, or which we sampled, so in Cody, in Jackson, inside Grand Teton and inside Yellowstone. Um, this is a snapshot of the, the demographics of the sample, which I won't get into, but I'll just say the next steps um, here are to one, check for non-response bias. Um, so this is, these are the people who obviously said yes to our survey. Um, we wanna know if they differ systematically from the folks who said no. And so we use the technique that the Park Service uses for their visitor use surveys, where those who said no, we asked, we ask you just two short questions um, to follow up and compare against those who do participate. So that was zip code and um, number of trips to the parks. And then we also recorded perceived gender and age. And so we'll use those to compare to our sample. Um, and then we'll also check for the representativeness of our sample. So does it is it representative of the, the populations of visitors that visit um, Yellowstone and Grand Teton parks? So we have, fortunately, really recent data. So 2018, data from Yellowstone and then um, Grand Teton conducted a visitor survey this past summer as well at the same time that we were. Um, and so we have some demographics that we can compare there. Um, we'll say just that we, uh, so we asked about the top three animals that visitors most want to see. Um, and again, that wide ranging wildlife ranks really highly. Um, bears, wolves, moose, elk, bison. Um, we also asked about the importance of wildlife viewing to the visitor's trip, um, decision to take a trip to the park. And we have three quarters of respondents there um, indicating that wildlife viewing was either the primary reason or one of several primary reasons for um, taking a trip to Yellowstone or Grand Teton. Um, so that's good, that's consistent with previous research. So it's a good, good start. Um, we also asked about some um, perspectives on different wildlife issues. So um, here we have, this is, this is a Likert scale where we asked respondents the extent to which they disagree or agree um, with the following statements. So this disagree in the uh, brown, agree in the green. Um, and so this first statement was about existence value, just knowing that wildlife in the parks this, that people get satisfaction from that. People overwhelmingly agreed with that. Um, the second one, the statement was, I prefer to spend money at local businesses that donate profits towards conserving wildlife. Um, this is something, there's an effort in the greater Yellowstone region to, for businesses to be raising money who profit off of wildlife um, to, to pay towards conservation. So I had some folks interested in this idea and we see that um, correspondents were um, largely supportive of that idea as well. Um, for private landowners should be compensated for supporting wide-ranging wildlife on their lands. We see a few more maybe neutral responses, um, but still a lot of support 
And then um, I would take fewer trips to the parks if there were fewer wine ranging wildlife around to view is um, perhaps more evenly distributed across um, those just descriptive. So we haven't analyzed this data yet. Um, we did ask, that's great. We did ask though um, respondents to indicate the degree to which they oppose or support the following options for raising money to conserve <coughs> wide ranging wildlife in and around the parks. And we see for all three options that we propose to, um, we see support largely, um, mostly for the voluntary um, donations, which makes sense. Um, but still three quarters of respondents were supportive of a, a conservation tax or fee on goods and services sold within the parks. And then still two thirds um, supported a mandatory wildlife conservation fee collected at all park entrances. So next, um, there are a lot of analysis to do for the in-person survey and um, the follow-up survey. Uh, one thing I'll just mention in the follow-up survey, we also asked um, a battery of questions related to wildlife value orientation. And this is a, a construct um, used by Taylor Manfredo to kind of take the pulse of wildlife conservation ethic and, and sentiment um, across the US. And so I think there could be something interesting to take those responses and then the sorts of values and willingness to pay that people um, people um, report and sort of map it with this larger data set if anyone is interested in the project. Um, but um, then of course we'll wanna share our results with funders and with decision makers and maybe try our hand again at the research and uh, learn from our mistakes next summer. So we'll see. <laughs> so um, yeah. All I've got. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. All right. So we'll open it up to questions from folks in the room and folks over Zoom. And I'll keep my eye on Zoom, Hillary, if you want right. to keep an eye on sure. questions from the room. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, do you plan on comparing like in-state residents versus out-of-state residents responses for those questions? Yeah. So. Right, yeah, so I sort of alluded to this like GYE thing. Yeah. So um, Aaron Enriquez, who's one of our collaborators, he did a survey with, and he has about 2,000 responses of folks who live in the GYE and he asked them very similar questions that will go into our travel cost model. So um, how many trips are you taking to the parks? What's the importance of viewing wildlife? What species do you wanna see? Um, and so I think we're talking about maybe combining our data um, and then looking for trends. I think. That sounds interesting to us, but I'm not quite sure what the like implications will be. I don't know if you have right. thoughts on like what do you what do you do with, like if locals are less willing to pay than visitors, you know, willing to pay less. There, what do you do with that information? Yeah. I'm not sure, but certainly as a resident here, it's got some intrigue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Nita's hand is up. Um, Nita, just it, I'm going to take moderator's privilege here and ask a quick question while I get ready to. Help you out over Zoom, but Hillary, I was wondering um, just how, if you've looked at the costs and fees associated with Yellowstone and Grand Teton versus other national parks mm -hmm. in the U.S. system and, and maybe internationally, and mm -hmm. how how much, uh, what you know, like is Yellowstone expensive compared to other types of yeah. experiences? Gosh, yeah, no, I hadn't looked at that. I mean, anecdotally, what I hear is it's like a bargain deal, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at the amount of money that people are spending to get to Yellowstone, it's a tiny the entrance fee is a tiny fraction of their overall trip costs. Um, not to say that it's not still for some um, a, um, an important part, you know, a significant part. So um, I think, um, but I think that that could be, when you start like thinking about the scale, like the proportion and the scale and, um, and then how that might, like, are you thinking about parks other what like elsewhere that are doing this? Yeah, or just you know how expensive Yellowstone is compared to Yosemite, or yeah. you know because I know each park has a little bit of a different structure. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone else know? I have no idea. Well, I always thought you could get a yearly pass and yeah. use it at any park. You I mean, can. I, last yeah. time I bought that, it was like five years ago. It was like eighty bucks. It's right. still, like, yeah. Still yeah. Buying, you know, yeah. 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 I'm not sure. That'd be. It's just interesting to me that across yeah. the U.S., each park has a different fee. I know. Yeah, yeah they're they're kind of their own little fiefdoms, actually. They do yeah. they do as they yeah. So yeah. 
Yeah. All right, Nita, sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. I, my internet connection is really poor, so I missed a bit of it, but Hillary was outstanding. Um, I was, um, what I heard of it is that uh, you talked about the what, what people were willing to do. Do you have any um, theories or ideas about why they're willing to do? Is there any data or other studies that can complement yours of the motivating factors that they would be willing to do these, um, uh, to be able to make these financial sacrifices or, or whatever they would consider? Um, yeah, um, I think it's, yeah, I guess I would look back at just the, you know, observing, um, observing park visitors in the parks or, or looking at what they say in these surveys that people just really seem to, to act and indicate that wildlife is really important to their experiences. And so to the extent that they feel um, responsible for contributing towards that, that public good of wildlife and conservation, they might be um, you know, wanting to, to maintain wildlife in perpetuity, then um, that would perhaps motivate them to, um, to pay towards conservation. I mean, that's always the, the challenge, right? Is that free riding and where, where you know, a mandatory fee might force, would force people to, to contribute towards conservation rather than and leaning on um, on others to take to provide that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so when you are finished, or if you go through other iterations of asking um, and getting an idea of how much people would be willing to contribute, do you guys have any models of of where that money would go based on other things that either national parks have done here in the United States or in other countries, ideas of sort of what it would mean yeah. building into where that money would go? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. And something as a researcher, I'm like, not yeah. probably going <laughs> to get too involved in. Um, no, but I think, um, right, so the, the state legislatures passed this resolution, certainly in their own interest, right, saying like the park should collect money and give it back to us because we're incurring a lot of costs managing this wildlife. Um, so in their minds, it should go to state wildlife agencies. Um, I think, you know, nonprofits probably have ideas about how that could be managed, maybe like multi-stakeholder sort of ways, but um, I think that's a really important step, you know, if you collect this money. And, um, and I will say too, you know, it's, you're also thinking about like the parks themselves, right? It means they have their costs mm -hmm. managing wildlife. And so is it exclusively to be redistributed outside of parks or can you kind of find a way to, um, to sort of satisfy everybody? Is, yeah. Is there, are there any like specific examples of where this has been done really well that you guys have based your ideas off of? Um, and sort of if there are places that have been done really well, how yeah. they got people invested maybe? Yeah. Gosh, I don't, there, was, no there was one example yeah. in our paper that she referenced where we looked at a, a park in India where mm -hmm. they did do a good job of mm -hmm. cost sharing um, mm -hmm. with transboundary communities, but it's um, mm -hmm. not something that's widely done, not mm -hmm. widely done, but maybe yeah. more on an international scale. Yeah, yeah, but that would probably be a great idea. Yeah, yeah. As I had a comment, I saw in the chat. She did, she did have a good comment. It wasn't a question, so I didn't call it or test it or put her on the spot, but she said just reservation requirements may be a bigger hurdle for many than the entrance. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you asked the question that I would, I mean, if, if we see lesser free ranging wildlife, I take fewer trips to Grand Deed and the Yellowstone. So 40% disagreed with your statement, right? Yeah. Why do you think is that? Yeah, well, for those who agree, I mean, I think it's it just indicative of that, the other, the like previous questions of like how important is wildlife viewing, right, to your trip? It's like, it's the, for a lot of folks, like, that's the reason to see a bear. Um, and so if you can't see a bear, maybe you just go somewhere closer or somewhere with other wildlife, you know, somewhere that does have wildlife. Um, so, but, it, but that one, yeah, I'd be interested. I'm not quite sure how to dig into that one because there were also a lot of folks that didn't agree, right? Um, and so I think that, that maybe, you know, there's a lot of reasons people go to the parks and there's a lot of amenities. And so maybe wildlife's just one of them, but yeah. 
Yeah, I have a question, actually two questions, more about how you structure like a survey that has like an in-person part and then like an online part. First, I wanted to know if you looked at how many people actually followed up that like, re re like responded to your uh, in-person mm -hmm. survey and then also went mm -hmm. home or on their phone and they yeah. actually did the second part because I've always wondered how, how much people are engaged in surveys or if they think like oh, another survey. <laughs> yeah. And then my second question was um, if uh, uh, another thing I've always wondered is how um, uh, truthful are people when they answer mm -hmm. some questions just because of course you have to say that you care about wildlife mm -hmm. so especially for I wondered if for those uh, more tricky questions like are you willing to pay this if there was an online uh, also question that was repeated from the in-person one yeah. just to see if people kind of like reply yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a term for that called the, the bias mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like when people know that they're part of research, they ask and that they would respond in a way that they think that the, the yeah. researchers want to hear. Yeah. Um, um, so for your first question, yeah, so this, so what we have, we have about 300 responses to the follow-up survey oh. right now. So not nothing, but not a thousand, right? Not everyone's doing it. Um, and, you know, the, so the park service uses this hybrid approach, but what they do is they actually they do an in-person in tablet survey, and then they have a printed copy of their follow-up survey. They hand that to the participant, they collect their mailing address, and then if they haven't gotten that, that mailed, that printed survey back, they send them another survey. And they've gotten like about a 60% response rate usually for that. And I think there's maybe like something in your hand for you to fill out, something you can kind of see again versus it like, because I've sent reminders to those who gave email addresses, which not everyone did. Um, that's easy to fall through the cracks. So, yeah, and then certainly I think we're also going to be sensitive to like who's responding to the follow-up survey. You know, is it people that are really excited about this wildlife issue? Maybe. Um, and so just be cautious with interpreting how representative they are of all park visitors. Um, second question. Oh, yes, right. Experiment, yeah, demand effect, right. So, um, so the, the willingness to pay question was actually asked online. So that one, we don't have that, um, don't have that kind of surveyor watching over your shoulder. Um, but it's certainly, even still, it's a, this hypothetical scenario, right? That you have, you always kind of, and so we have, we actually have questions in the survey that kind of try to do these checks, like how believable was this scenario? How much, did, how well did you understand the, the fund or the fee set up? Um, how likely do you think that these results are to are to influence policy? And so you can actually kind of do these checks, these debriefing checks to be like, you know, is this was this setup reliable and sort of valid in the mind of the person who is responding? Or are they just like, sure, I'll pay a thousand dollars? You know, like what what does this matter? You know, so we try, but it's hard. That's a real challenge. Yeah, yeah, Lucas. I was wondering whether you're collecting any data, or even if you think it would be relevant at all to collect data on people's experiences with wildlife and whether or not if they just finished their trip in Yellowstone and they saw like one bison in three days versus whether they just finished their trip and saw grizzly bears and wolves and all that and whether their actual experiences in the park with wildlife would affect their willingness to pay yeah, for some sort of conservation. That's great. Yeah, and we actually have that data. So I think that, so we, we asked in that online survey, um, well, so one sort of set of questions I think will be interesting. We asked, did you participate in wildlife viewing in your trip? Yes or no. And then which wildlife did you see? And so you'd think if somebody said no, they could they would say none, but like just at a quick look at the data, that's not true. So maybe there's also this, this like distinction between the, like wildlife viewing as an activity versus like seeing wildlife, right? Um, and then so we asked which animals folks saw and and then also um I think it was Leslie who works at the Park Service was really interested in also having a sense of um, the numbers of, what, of animals that people are seeing too, because we don't really know that. So if people said that they saw wolves, bears, elk, maybe, maybe also pronghorn and deer, um, we asked how many, like estimates are fine and just ask for a dollar or a numeric value. Um, so I think, yeah, that would that could be really interesting to use that data. Moderates. Yeah. 
Right. Were you measuring a change in the pre and post surveys or what was the intention of having a post survey? Um, to, of asking about wildlife in the post. Yeah, were you looking at like something about after the visit, are their responses different or mm -hmm. is that just a way to ask more questions? Yeah, yeah. That so that mostly it was that because this like as you saw on that slide like it's a really sort of in, like, involved setup. There's a lot of text um, to ask about to do these contingent valuation questions, um, and we had initially thought of like this is what we really want to know. We should do this in person where we know we can get a thousand responses instead of three hundred. But the like burden on the, the participant to be like to read out you know to read to them this like whole scenario and. Um, all the additional text that's sort of required for making it a valid question was a lot. So that was the real motivation in doing it um, as a two part. Meanwhile, yeah. old faithful's going off in the background and yeah. I'm missing it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like people were pretty happy to talk. I went out a couple of days and it was I was it was nice. Like people were um were pretty open, but they're also like they're not there to chit chat about they want to enjoy the experience. So yeah, we were also trying to keep it short. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sorry, I, my or question was just I think Arthur's done such just amazing work to show like how animals migrate into the park to be there in the summer when the visitors are there, but then you know in the winter they escape the snow and they go down to the lowlands around the park, um, yeah. which is really helpful to educating the public as to the value of the transboundary lands around right. the park. Right. Did you get a sense or was there a way to like ask the question about people's knowledge of, yeah. of the lands around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we did ask that. Um, because that that's also that's a big interest of Arthur's. Yeah, you know, it's like is his research work. Yeah, it is. It is it like you know, yeah. there's this the like I think some folks joke that like park park visitors think that national parks are zoos, right? Like they show up and there's animals just live here, and it's super, you know, it's like. But um, so we did ask um, several different questions, but like, are you? It's it's just really hard. like how yeah. do you measure? Yeah, that? you know, we yeah. struggled with this, and so I think the way we did it is is. You know, we were setting up the like informing people to giving them enough information so they could answer the contingent valuation question. And so we'd say, like, you know, wildlife require all this habitat, they travel all these boundaries. Did you know that wildlife in the greater Yellowstone requires habitat beyond park boundaries? Yes or no? Um, and I've just done like a quick like table of that. It seems I'm seeing it like 85% of people say yes. Okay. One well, thing with, and then we talked about threats. Um, do you know? Like you know, the wildlife vehicle collisions and all the things that I, I mentioned. Did you know that wildlife face threats outside park boundaries? Yes or no? So it's a little thin, but yeah, hopefully yeah. something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, is there any desire to kind of maybe do a comparative study outside of the United States? So like you use Antietam Yellowstone as like the examples here, but like you kind of talked about how. This is an issue worldwide with protected areas. So, would you expect similar results, say, if you were to look at national parks or protected areas in Africa and then maybe Asia? Um, what's the desire yeah. there? Yeah, I mean, sure, right? Let's go. No, <laughs> no I, there have been some studies done. Um, I know one in Uganda where the people travel to see all these exotic birds and they did this sort of um, valuation question that yeah people like often say they're willing to pay um because again you imagine a lot of the visitors are um were not local not even african and so they that like the entrance fee to this ugandan park was just like a tiny fraction of what it costs to get from london to uganda and all the like everything else um so yeah i think i think that there's yeah to your point in, in temples too like Kind of as we start to think about what point, like how we're going to situate this study in literature and in what's, how it might be useful, I think we should look at more closely at other examples and yeah, and then maybe do another study. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> Where we we work in Mongolia. Oh yeah, yeah. it's the mm -hmm. the oldest. The first or the second oldest protected area in the world, wow. oh. and it's a Bodkan Mountain. And uh, it is not just a part like for natural, um, like kind of like uh, for people that are interested in natural resources, but it also has like some religious and cultural value because yeah. of 
you know, there's a lot of buddhams there. And so they give value to the mother earth and the father sky and all that is in the middle. <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, and uh, so over there, there is not like a fee to go into the, the park. And yeah. even if it's a strictly protected area formally, then I can practice that are like other issues uh, as in most of the developing countries. But I would be interested like that, yeah. since uh, especially because many people go there and you know, just to visit sanctuaries, mm -hmm. if uh, that they would be willing to pay even just a little bit just to go visit all of these monuments and sanctuaries that are yeah. other than seeing the right. <laughs> right, right. And you could have, and I think this is what some other international parks have done, you know, you can have an exception for locals, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you're not creating yeah. extra barriers exactly. for people mm -hmm. to enjoy this sacred mm -hmm. places, yeah. but. Yeah. yeah. I have another question for Hillary, but this idea, I've always kind of struggled with the willingness to pay. It's always like, I always want to inflate probably how much I would actually be willing to pay. Yeah. Um, but if somebody's like, okay, yeah. now pay it, I might be like, oh, like, <laughs> like, yeah. how, like what I actually follow through and what yeah. my stated, you know, preference would be or stated right. willingness to pay. Right. Um, do you have a, any ideas of how you might actually be able to test? Like getting past the like more abstract willingness to pay to actually yeah. seeing if people would follow through on actions like yeah, in a right. perfect world like how would you think about trying to do that? I mean, we just you just collect money, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or is that yeah. would you like ask them a hypothetical like and randomize the amount? And, yeah, like and yeah. then see if they actually yeah. follow through with that. Yeah, I mean, like I think I think we've talked about this as like an interesting follow up to actually then like go to the Buffalo Bill Center and work with like greater Yellowstone and have a plan of like, okay, now we're actually like taking money, you know, for we have the cause um, and see how well those, those values align. But it would be fun on the online survey to have that for people that say they want to donate in the amount yeah. and have a fake button that says, okay, now you can donate here. Yeah. yeah. See how many people actually yeah. click on it <laughs> and then say, oh, it was just a <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, that great hey, question. I don't know. You know, this is, I don't know a lot about the willingness to pay. Like, it's newer to me, but surely there must be some that have like bridged this. And that might be an interesting kind of follow on for us. Yeah. yeah. Another question about willingness to pay is have you looked into what people are willing to pay for or how different, different wording could make people more willing to pay for something, i.e., a $5 fee for um, stewardship of private lands versus a $5 fee directly to this state? grant funds that yeah. would end up being funneled to that search of lands. I saw 10 or 15% of people strongly disagreed with, with paying for uh, conservation stewardship of private lands. Maybe they yeah. have some grievance with that, yeah. that kind of work. Yeah, um, yeah. totally. I, I mean, don't know there's a question there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that is like, that is always the challenge with these sorts of, um, these sorts of surveys is you're just beholden to like the words that you choose and how much, and so you try to, I mean, a lot of the wording we just tried to be um, sort of representative of like this is what's happening and this is what's being proposed and drawing directly from those statements. We can lean on that and rather just like this is what I came up with, you know, well, I couldn't sleep last night kind of a thing, like trying to lean on that. But um, yeah, I, I think it could definitely influence, you know, people. And so, well, hopefully, though, too, we have a lot of these follow up questions. So maybe we can. You know, we can control for preferences for, um, you know, who should manage the concert. So we actually also ask, like, who do you think is responsible for paying the costs of conservation? We have, like, American taxpayers, uh, people who value wildlife, people who hunt wildlife, people who, um, and so maybe there's some of these, like, sort of preference variables that can help us tease apart, like, who's maybe... Um, affected by some of that wording or some of, some of those the angles of the way we framed it up. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, great. Well, I think we, we will actually end on time today. Um, I've been trying to stay a little tighter yeah. to our time frame, but thank, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. With Wednesdays next week, and Dr. Jake Hochard um, from Health School is going to join us to talk about new national strategy to reflect national assets on American and Wyoming's balance sheet. And Gracie, you're on deck to introduce Dr. Hochard. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody back next week. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.